Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. With a substantial demand of military hardware, the conflict-ridden Middle East has become one of the most significant regions in the world's arms market. To further discuss this topic, I'm joined here in the studio by Dr. Eli Carmon, a senior researcher at the Institute for Counterterrorism at IDC Herzliya. Welcome. Hello. I'd like to also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Neil Boms, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Welcome. Mr. Oren, uh, give us a broader understanding of this topic today? By all measures, uh, this is a very significant issue because the uh, arms market uh, has a sizable um, slice of the domestic budgets in all of the important countries in the Middle East. It is also a very significant slice of the export market of various powers, mostly the United States and Russia, with others such as France and uh, lagging behind China, trying uh, to um, butt in. And obviously, it's a very important tool in order to influence policy in various aspects of what is happening in the Middle East, both domestically uh, within countries and as those countries are trying to fashion a foreign policy of their own. Well, I'd like to uh, read a quote of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute just to give our viewers also a better understanding of this topic. Uh, the global transfer of major weapon systems rose over the past five years to the highest volume since the end of the uh, Cold War as the Middle East nearly doubled its imports, which is a significant amount, of course, in a region ridden with conflict, plagued by so many different wars. Dr. Carmon, how do you perceive this? Uh, Already the Middle East uh, has 29% of the world market, which is a huge amount of uh, hardware uh, arriving here in the region. And because the uh, conflicts in the region are only uh, developing, and uh, not only between uh, the various players, but today we have the two camps on the one hand, and the great powers on the ground, I think this represents clearly a uh, uh, danger not for them these moments, but for the future of the region because many of these uh, weapons are very modern weapons. Uh, for instance, not only Israel, but also the Emirates have received the F-35 advanced uh, uh, American airplane. So this means that uh, there is the possibility that we'll have a very uh, uh, technological war in the region with even small countries like the Emirates or Qatar having this kind of, of weapons. Dr. Bombs? Well, one of the reasons uh, I think that we see this is that because weapons have become so cheap, in some ways they also became much more expensive. And, and to explain that is because we, as we've discussed in previous programs here, uh, there, there's more weapons. Uh, more weapons are now available to terrorist groups, to non-state groups. Uh, and now it is more plausible that the terrorist groups will actually launch a missile. Mm. Now a country needs to protect from that. And for that, they need to pr purchase a much more expensive system, uh, including radars and anti-missile systems. And all of a sudden, they realize that they need to rearm in a more significant way. And therefore, because weapons on the one hand become so cheap and available, now uh, many countries realize that they need to arm themselves and protect themselves. And of course, that's the excuse. The second issue is that uh, we discussed the uh, increase since the Cold War. And in some ways, we're back to some Cold War dynamics, when we have a competition for regional hegemony between the Russians and the Americans, uh, and both are using uh, the sales uh, uh, of weapons as an instrument to increase their influence in the region. Well, you're talking about the United States, obviously, a country that its defense budget supersedes all countries in the world combined and still exceeds that by a few uh, billions of dollars. Mr. Oren, the number one importer of U.S. military hardware and software is uh, the Saudi Arabia, a country that until recently didn't receive this kind of attention from Washington due to its uh, conflict with Israel. And suddenly it uh, came to a deal of $100 billion. Of course, number two, United Arab Emirates and Turkey uh, are also significant uh, uh, contributors to this import of sophisticated weapons. How does this actually fuel different challenges, not only for the state of Israel, but also for the region at large? 
Well, Donald Trump um, uh, has turned himself the master of the art of the deal, and obviously uh, you personally have been captivated by his marketing prowess because this figure of 100 or 110 billion dollars actually includes many deals which the Obama administration started, but Trump uh, decided to encompass within uh, his own deal. But the, the real irony is that the Western powers have started their relationship to arms exports into the Middle East very naively uh, in 1950 uh, with the uh, trilateral arms embargo on the Israelis and the Arabs. Again, naively thinking that if they don't sell arms, then there will be no arms race. And of course, the Soviets have bypassed this embargo through the so-called uh, Czechoslovak deal in 1955, and there has been an arms race ever since between the West and the East. Now, for the Americans, there are several considerations here. One is keeping the Israeli military qualitative edge as promised by various presidents. That means that technologically, Israel will always be one step ahead. This is quality, but also by quantity. Israel will get, not only buy, but will get because it is all financed by the Americans, it will get virtually all that it wants. Now, as for the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar, they are getting uh, some of the most sophisticated weapons for various reasons. First of all, the Americans have important bases there for the Navy, their Air Force, and the Army. For the American uh, arms industry, it is, of course, very important as it competes within itself and with other exporters, Lockheed Martin versus Boeing and the like. And for various states and congressional districts, it's very important that certain production lines be kept in these districts so that these representatives and senators vote for these exports. So it's politics, it's security, it's economics, uh, it all um, gives uh, the rationale for exporting more and more to uh, ever more countries. Nevertheless, uh, for years, the American administration has been very adamant of maintaining various policies with regard to the Middle East, specifically when it comes to weapon sales. It made sure that the recipients of their weapons would not also make trade deals of uh, various uh, competing weapons from different countries, especially enemy states, whether it uh, be within those markets, also uh, the former Soviet Union, today Russia. Today, it doesn't happen this way. We see Egypt, on the one hand, receiving various lucrative deals from the United States and then also uh, competing with uh, various uh, countries to uh, receive the latest technology from uh, the Russian Federation and also making significant deals with France for uh, different frigates and other weapons. And we see also the United Kingdom playing a key role in uh, Saudi Arabia, as well as other countries that also have significant interest in fueling uh, their economy with significant sums of money when it comes to the Middle East. Dr. Kaman, how do you see all those conflicts of interest actually uh, simulated within this uh, chaotic region? I think there are two new trends, very important ones. First is the entrance in force by Russia in the region and not only uh, supporting the Syrians and cooperating with the Iranians, but also trying actually to be in good relationships with all the players in the region. Egypt, for instance, you mentioned, because by the way, the Americans, the Obama administration for two years embargoed uh, the selling of weapons to Egypt, uh, and also to Turkey, for instance, uh, and even to Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, because I think Russia already has a new standing as a great power in the region and wants to expand this kind of uh, uh, influence of impact in the region. And therefore, I think we'll see this kind of trend developing uh, more in the next uh, two, three years. And also we see that the uh, recipients, including the Saudis, for instance, which want to use the uh, buying of weapons from Russia in order to influence their policy against Iran or in Syria. The second trend is indeed the Iranian issue, because until lately there were sanctions against Iran. Uh, in 2020, these sanctions will disappear, at least if everything goes well for the Iranians. But already the Russians are supporting the uh, Iranians in defensive uh, armaments, for instance, the anti-missile S-300 
uh, missiles, and they already uh, sold them these missiles. And here is the issue of the balance of power between the Arab states and the Iranians. And uh, for the moment, at least, the Iranians are in a very bad position because uh, the uh, advanced uh, technology that the uh, Arabs have, especially Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, uh, and even Egypt, compared to the Iranians, does not permit them uh, for the moment, or at least in the uh, foreseeable future, to uh, balance this uh, uh, force. And that's why I think they use the asymmetric uh, warfare in Syria, in uh, Iraq, and in Yemen, because they understand that this is more dangerous, using uh, the asymmetric warfare using the proxy and the Shia uh, minorities in the region. Well, something that actually baffles me, which comes to the specific sales of surface-to-air missiles or anti-aircraft missiles, we're talking about the S-300 sale from Russia to the Islamic Republic of Iran, something that uh, was challenged with different hurdles over the way, also because of the various sanctions that were implemented on Tehran for its uh, nuclear aspirations. Nevertheless, Dr. Bombs, when we're looking at those sales, we see different countries that are demanding the advanced capabilities of Russia, the S-400A or the S-400 proper, which uh, would grant them different uh, uh, added values in combating Western warfare, specifically Egypt and Turkey. And Turkey specifically, which is something that may raise some questions, a member of uh, the NATO alliance has been uh, a member of the NATO alliance since the early 50s and now is playing playing quite uh, a game of uh, weapon uh, purchases, both from uh, the East as well as from the West. How does this actually not challenge the, the balance of power when we're talking about weapon sales? Well, it certainly change, challenges the balance of power, not just in terms of weapon sales, but also in terms of the camps that these countries belong to. Turkey has been challenging the European system, it's been challenging the global system uh, in terms of which camp it belongs to and which axis does it belong to. Uh, <coughs> it has been you know, switching sides uh, on, on different parts of the war or before the war with uh, Syria. It's now coordinating you know, more with the Russians uh, in also respect to the conflict in Syria and with Iran. Uh, and that certainly challenges not just the arms market, it challenges the regional uh, system overall. Just to uh, remind you, just last month, uh, we've seen a ship from North Korea captured near the shores of Egypt uh, with a, another significant weapon sale coming from sort of out of the woodwork from an unexpected, almost an unexpected place. So uh, as you've said before, some of the rules of the game uh, has simply been violated, simply been broken. Uh, and that challenges and continues to challenge uh, not just the arms market, but really the regional system and the balance of power in the region at large. Mr. Owen, put things in order for us. Um, Militarily, it doesn't make sense to buy from so many sources. For, for a single military force to, to rely on so many suppliers doesn't make sense professionally because it's a logistical nightmare. They have to maintain it. And this is usually the weak spot in Arab military forces maintaining the, the uh, air forces, maintaining the missiles, the uh, electronics. Uh, when war starts, uh, things go wrong, and they have to rely on contractors from various corporations, various uh, producers, and it doesn't really make sense. But it does make sense diplomatically not to be dependent on a single source, even though this single source doesn't have that much of a leverage. And we saw President de Gaulle of France 50 years ago uh, in the run-up to the Six-Day War, when uh, France was the de facto only supplier of the Israeli Defense Forces, he threatened an embargo on uh, sales to Israel. Israel, nevertheless, went to war. He did establish the embargo, but Israel went ahead and bought from the United States. So it's good only if you keep it uh, as a deterrent, but uh, you are not trying to implement it. But having so many uh, frigates and uh, surface-to-air missiles, some of them are only status symbols, they are not really that uh, effective. Uh, and having aircraft from various uh, producers and various countries, it doesn't make sense. Dr. Kamon, uh, the United Kingdom has been 
one of the key suppliers of Saudi Arabia when it comes to weaponry. Almost half of all its weapon sales went to the kingdom. And uh, there is, of course, a significant interest in maintaining this relationship. Uh, is there some kind of leverage on Western countries in actually meddling or trying to maintain their national interests in those different uh, countries pertaining to those weapon sales? Uh, the interesting thing is that in spite of internal opposition, especially by liberal and uh, human rights groups, which uh, uh, claim that Saudi Arabia especially, but other countries are not democratic uh, regimes. So it is uh, to be forbidden to sell them weapons, uh, including there was a vote in the European Parliament, which practically asked uh, to uh, stop the selling of uh, weapons to this uh, region, but it is only symbolic. I mean, because of economic especially, but also strategic uh, uh, reasons, Great Britain, but also France and even Germany are enhancing their export of weapons to the Middle East, including especially to the Saudis, but also to the Egyptians, uh, to the smaller uh, Gulf uh, countries and even to, to Turkey. And uh, we saw, for instance, Germany in the last year, 2017, has quintupled five more, uh, times more selling weapons to Saudi Arabia and to Egypt than a year ago in the 2016. So uh, clearly the economic uh, reasons are very, very important because there is a crisis uh, in many of these countries. Uh, the, the weapons uh, market is very important for, uh, or ex uh, weapons export is very important for the economic stability, internal stability. And again, Clearly, uh, France and the uh, uh, United Kingdom want to influence strategically. Uh, and uh, the case of Egypt is very interesting because the uh, French, which uh, wanted to sell ships, corvettes to the Russians, were uh, stopped by the European embargo. They decided to sell them to the, uh, to the uh, Egyptians. And by the way, the Russians were quite happy because they uh, also gave some kind of approval for this uh, move and they also uh, won mm. some points in the eyes of the Egyptians. There is also another consideration here and that is economy of scale. Because of the pressure on the various defense budgets in Western countries, each plane, for instance, the F-35, would be more expensive if it is not exported for their own countries. So the Air Force, for instance, of the United States, as well as the Navy and the Marines, mm put pressure on the administration to sell it. The more they sell it, of course, minus the, the secret technology, but the more they sell it, it will cost less to them. Dr. Bombs, uh, we've talked in this uh, program quite often about the proxy wars, uh, the various challenges and the rivalries within the Middle East, uh, particularly, of course, the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran, where the Iranians back uh, various Shiite militias as the Saudis back uh, various uh, Sunni militias. Are the Saudis and the uh, Iranians actually playing within the constellation of the world power proxy wars where they're using those two different uh, countries and other countries in the region to fuel their uh, national uh, strategic interests and global interests uh, of the United States uh, and Russia in particular? This is a classic example of uh, another part of the proxy war. Uh, because when the United States and also when the United Kingdom sells arms <coughs> and sophisticated weapons to a country like Saudi Arabia, who is not necessarily able to absorb them very, very quickly, it also means that they need to bring people, advisors, perhaps strategies. They also need to now figure out how to deal with these particular systems and the rest of the military. And they may need to have some advice on that. That really means that you're working on the strategic or the super tactical level in the military. And now you have influence, not just in the hardware and the software, but really in the strategy and the military structure of uh, these countries, which are still, broadly speaking, you know, are more connected to the third world than to the developed world. So this is a, a classic uh, a proxy move. The Russians, by the way, have been playing something similar with the other side. Uh, of course, they're when they're dispatched in, uh, in Syria, they're the ones who are in control of this with their own military installations, with their own military bases, with their own people saying, you know, we're going to work out some of these systems for you. And when they're now doing the same thing with Iran, they're doing the same. And sometimes the Russians have the adopted this strategy of, you know, we're actually going to give you the weapons relatively cheap, but you're going to pay for the personnel and the people and the infrastructure that's probably going to be there for quite some time because of the gap, because of the qualitative gap uh, uh, within 
the, the ability to absorb this system that really requires very significant external help. Dr. Kalman, how do you perceive this? Yeah, by the way, uh, from the uh, Russian point of view, weapons and oil are the only exports. They don't have, uh, like the Chinese, a huge uh, uh, industry, uh, light industry. So uh, if they don't sell uh, weapons, uh, and also they had the problems to prove that the new uh, Russian technology, which they developed during the last years, and uh, the West did not pay perhaps uh, much attention, but they showed by the use uh, by using long-range cruise missiles uh, and uh, uh, also uh, ICBMs, in, uh, and also using, by the way, Iran as uh, uh, territory or corridor for their weapons. This also proved that the Russians are able to modernize and to uh, be uh, an important uh, actor especially in the Mediterranean, but also against NATO because they, for instance, later uh, had a huge uh, uh, drill, a military drill, on the border with Europe. Uh, and uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, worry in the uh, European Union, or in the NATO if you want, that this could uh, develop in a, uh, in a real war. So uh, the, I think the, the, the play now in this field is extremely important for the balance of power between the great powers and also between the smaller regional powers like Turkey with Iran, Turkey with Saudi Arabia, by the way, the Turks now are, have a military base in Qatar, which is under embargo by the Saudis and the Emirates, mm. which is a new uh, phenomenon that we didn't see in the past. Well, I'd like to go from the imports of weapons to the current weapon industry within the Middle East. Of course, we hear about uh, Israel's weapon industry, which is a very significant portion of Israel's economy. Economy, as well as the various challenges that Israel faces from Iranian industries when we're talking about precision uh, weapons reaching its proxies, primarily the Lebanese Shiite organization Hezbollah. Uh, Mr. Oren, give us a little bit of an understanding on that uh, uh, aspect. It, uh, it ties in exactly with the uh, earlier subjects because one of the reasons the Americans and others are keen on exporting is so that there is no indigenous arms industry developed in these countries, which would then become uh, a competitor with their own um, corporations. Now, Israel, um, until a few years ago, had some uh, illusions or delusions of grandeur. It wanted to produce platforms, and it saw that uh, its own military is not big enough to support it, and it will not be able to export too much. So. The, the platforms, a fighter aircraft, main battle tank, the main uh, missile boat, uh, have to be bought elsewhere. Where Israel can specialize is in munitions, such as air-to-ground missiles and bombs, electronics, cyber, homeland defense, all of these, all of these niche products where the big guys did not pay attention for long when they concentrated on the big items such as planes and tanks. Mm. Dr. Kalman? I think Israel had a problem, and by the way, after France made the embargo, we are uh, quite dependent on the American market because we also received $3 billion or more uh, for buying weapons in the United States. And this uh, limits our possibility to diversify, like, for instance, the Saudis or the Turks vis-a-vis, -vis, although we have, by the way, some projects with the Russians, but very minor ones. Uh, and uh, also, we are limited where we can export. Mm -hmm. First of all, because uh, not everybody wants to buy, uh, and also because the Americans are trying to uh, use their influence on our technology not to be uh, uh, spread uh, around. Well, and much we of the Israeli technology is, is a joint venture also with the United States. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but we depend on their approval for s some countries mm -hmm. or some technologies. And we have the example of India. Just uh, two days ago, uh, there was an announcement that a uh, very important uh, half billion uh, contract with the uh, uh, Indians on uh, developing or in selling uh, spike uh, uh, missiles uh, were cancelled because the Indians want themselves to develop this kind of... Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a very tough uh, market, if you want, and has a strategic uh, consequence. Also second-hand weapons because of <coughs> the end-user monitoring mm -hmm. by the Americans. Even if Israel wants to get some money from uh, stuff which is no longer frontline, 
it has to get American approval. Dr. Bombs, I'd like to touch base on uh, the Iranian industry. Of course, uh, it's been working very hard on its ballistic missile capabilities, uh, which have uh, brought it uh, under scrutiny and uh, quite some uh, international pressures uh, by the international community proper who have demanded that they uh, thwart uh, those capabilities, at least for uh, the time being. Uh, how do you see the transfer of high, uh, high sophisticated guided missiles from the Islamic Republic via Iraq and Syria to Lebanon, as well as to the Houthis, uh, where we saw the Houthi rebels fire a ballistic missile towards Riyadh, which was Iranian made according to the Saudis and other uh, actors in the region. How is this actually challenging the region? Well, the Iranian Revolution had uh, put uh, a very significant emphasis on military infrastructure. Uh, immediately, they have launched a war that lasted for nine, nine years, and they had, uh, they're had uh, spending quite significant uh, resources on the various military uh, installations, uh, including on the developments of uh, weapons. Uh, they're also very proud of it. You see reports on different uh, weapon systems uh, that are being displayed. Not all of them have been tested, but what the proxy wars are able to do, certainly in Yemen and also uh, in Lebanon with uh, Hezbollah and now in Syria, is actually to test uh, some of these systems as well as the strategies is um, and the coordination in between them. When it comes to missiles, something that became very significant also in the context of the JCPOA and the context of uh, the agreement on a nuclear uh, uh, issue is the capability and the increasing capability of Iran to develop uh, sophisticated long-term missiles that are able to uh, carry different warheads, which are not sanctions uh, under the uh, JCPOA. Uh, and we began to see uh, some of these missiles, uh, particularly now in Yemen, realizing as the intelligence have anticipated uh, that the Iranians actually have these capabilities and that they're able to uh, export them and bring them and improve uh, the uh, accuracy uh, and the effectiveness of both short and long-term missiles, something that is very much an issue when it comes to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Well, uh, not, not to, uh, to export them, but to smuggle them. This is a difference, yes, mm -hmm. because they are uh, embargoed and uh, also many powers are trying to uh, stop them before they arrive in Yemen. Talking about the JCPO and the various uh, angles of this, unfortunately, we're reaching to the end of the program. Mr. Oren, I'd like to touch base on a very short uh, uh segment of uh, this program, when we're talking about the challenges this region faces, uh, does this uh, weapons industry and uh, the weapons market at large fuel the various challenges? And if this is mitigated, will it also confront and alleviate the various conflicts? Nations will always have interests and will always want to protect those interests by military force, sometimes defensively, sometimes aggressively or offensively. But it's really unfortunate that the economies of the region, which are in need for development and for human advancement, are uh, being burdened by these defense budgets, some of whom are dedicated to purchases, but some of them to bases and salaries and pensions. It would have been better if the region was more peaceful and less dependent on arms markets. Well, if only we could change weapons into peaceful endeavors. Uh, this is all the time that we have for today. Unfortunately, I'd like to thank Dr. Carmon, thank Mr. You. Oren, and Dr. Bones for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.